All right. Looks like we started up. Hi, okay. Cozy. Hey. <laughs> they left, they left, they've left us to our own devices, Greg. I know it's you, you and I. Uh, Never a safe thing. They should know better by now than to do that. Right now, we well, we have control. So uh, welcome everybody. I see some people signing on. Yep. All right, guys. Hey, Johnny V, you made it on time. Oh, man. Awesome. Hey, Sophia, how are you? Guys, try out the chat box just so we know, make sure everyone's getting in there. Their, they can uh, type in the chat box and that way if you guys have any questions, that's where you'll put them in for tonight. Great. Good. Johnny V, I see you on here. Uh, thanks for sending your air ticket. I'm going to try to make it over, my friend. Uh, you yeah. sure did or two. And we've got Beth on board this evening. Welcome, Beth. All right. Sophia. Tonight's really tonight a different, a different take on some of the other topics we've done. So I've been wanting to do this one for a long time. So good. I'm a student tonight too. So I'm gonna listen to all the the things that I don't listen to that I overlook that my PT tell is teaching me. So uh, <laughs> yeah. So welcome everybody. Happy October. I can't believe this yeah. month is almost over. I'm, I'm not sure where this month has gone, Cozy, but do you have your kids all set up ready for Halloween? And I literally just went to one of those crazy pop-up stores and I got like a ninja sword and like a mask for one kid and a cat mask for the other kid. Yeah. I just basically give them one or two things and I'm like, all right, guys, put your costume together. Have fun. Right. Figure it out. There you go. Here, here's the basis of it all. That's all. That's yeah. Perfect. No, my son was like, what are you going to be for Halloween, mom? And I'm like, I'm going to be the tired mom. It's a scary yeah, enough. That's right. scary <laughs> enough uh... Yeah. So that great time of year. I, I always loved it. And I used to make my house uh, when my, my, my son was young, just the scariest you know, monster shack. And we'd have like 300 kids and, you know, uh, miss those days and miss them, you know, so. Oh, wow. So Sophia's going to be a cat for Halloween. Oh, yeah. Let's see. Yeah. What's the costumes? I'm curious. There's uh, one guy out there. He's gone viral. I don't know how many times. And I think he's an AK and he has the most amazing. He's been on the Ellen show and he incorporates his amputation into every Halloween costume. So I think he was like, you know, the Pixar lamp. Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. He recreated the Pixar lamp. He made himself into the Pixar lamp and like the jumping, the way that the, the lamp jumps. And <laughs> it's super cool. I forgot what it is. Somebody probably out here has, has heard about him. I've seen uh, uh, I've seen a few uh, of uh, one of my friends when as uh, like uh, uh, oh, I've seen it all. One of my best friends though he turned on a wood lathe a four by four into the most beautiful pirate leg, and you know that's always the classic first go to. But nice, uh, yeah, I've seen some cool stuff. That is pretty cool. Yeah. All right, guys, we got Ashley on board. I see some of you guys on board. So we're going to go ahead and get started. So guys, welcome to the Vital Fit webinar series. Um, as always, we want to give a big thank you to Vital Fit for sponsoring these webinars that we've been doing for almost a year and a half now, Greg. Right. I know it's gone by quickly. Uh, to just saying this month flies by, but yeah, Vital Fit's been a big supporter of this. And, and thanks for everybody who shows up and listens in. Uh, you can learn some stuff and uh, they're a great sponsor and they're in it for uh, to see all of us do better. So it's awesome. So. Yep. And so those of you joining us for the first time, welcome. My name is Cosi Bayoso. I'm a physical therapist, amputee specialist here in Tampa, Florida. I'm also the host of Cosi Talk. Some of y'all may have seen me on Wednesday nights at 8.30 p.m. on Facebook Live. So also bring the education there. And with me is my amazing co-host, Greg Menino. He is a prosthetist and, you know, he's kind of a slacker. He's only a 22-time Paralympian Olympian. <laughs> And downhill skiing, an amazing, amazing athlete himself. So welcome, guys. Yeah, thanks, Cozy. Uh, it's good to be here. It's good to be on another one of these uh, Vital Fit sponsor webinars with you because I learn from you every time I'm on. And tonight, I'm excited to learn more about the PT terminology as a prosthetist. I overlook some things that we get focused on what we do and, and not what we sh uh, should be listening to. So I'm open ear and open mind. So uh, everybody, you're going to learn some cool stuff tonight. So definitely. Thank you. So guys, this is actually going to be a two-part series. So tonight, we're going to talk about all the stuff that comes out of your PT's mouth. And then in our next webinar, it's going to be Greg's turn. Um, and he's going to help translate everything that your prosthetist might be saying to you. So guys, at this point, I want you to write in the chat section. Write anything 
that your physical therapist has said to you that made you go, what are they saying? Or it's all Greek to me. Okay. So we put together a list here. Y'all are going to get a crash course <laughs> on the basics of anatomy. And the reason why I wanted to do this is because, you know, communication is the most important thing with your clinician, whether it's your physical therapist, your prosthetist, or your, you know, your physician or anybody else in your medical team. And definitely when I have a patient who comes in and is using some of these words, it makes me, it, it does catch my attention a little bit more. And it tells me, wow, this person's taken the time uh, to learn more about their own body. Um, and also when it comes time, and you're going to see this with some of these words that we're going to teach you tonight, when it comes time to talking about how your prosthesis is fitting or not fitting, um, if you know some of these landmarks, it kind of helps out with that. So Greg, what, what do you experience? No, I absolutely agree. I think that uh, if you're new to amputation uh, and you're new to this whole world, um, it's what a, a lot, and a lot, you know, I've been guilty of the two. It's like, we're going to do this, this, and this, we're going to do ischial containment, and we're going to do this knee or fit. So educating yourself and understanding your anatomy and where the prosthesis is going to match up to you and the term and uh, that your prosthetist may be using or, um, or your PT is using, I think the most important thing is uh, knowing what you're in for and doing the research. And, and Cozy, the gal that you that I sent to you, Kayla, she had a patient that were reached out to me, a new amputee. She was doing the research and I, 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 I uh, forwarded her over to Cozy to learn about PT and what the PT terminology is to optimize your outcome. So again, we're all here to optimize our outcome and be knowledgeable what we're going to experience in the in the in the front or if you're an old season guy like me what to expect at that point of your rehab so i think it's great i think it's uh um, nobody's gonna drive you home so you gotta drive your own bus kind of thing so. <laughs> yes ashley that is a fantastic question and we will be covering this so uh, apparently ashley hears from her physical therapist your hip flexors are still weak almost four years later and i'm still not sure what those are. okay good that's a great we are question. covering yeah. those tonight ashley so guys for me I love the human body. That's obviously why I went into this field and I loved anatomy. That was probably my favorite course. A lot of people don't know that it, physical therapists, we take the same anatomy course that medical students will take. We will do the whole cadaver dissection and everything. And I know it sounds a little gory, but it's Halloween. So I think it's appropriate. Uh, so needless to say, anatomy, huge favorite, big nerd right here. So we're going to start with just the basics of anatomy. And many of you have probably heard me talk about a lot of this terminology already. So we're gonna start, obviously we got the cranium skull, right? People know about that. By the way, this is Bob. He's my uh, reluctant model tonight. So be nice to Bob. Then we have the spine, right? And the spine comes from all the way up here, all the way down to the tailbone, okay? This part is called your cervical spine, okay? It's, it's cervical is Latin for neck. So that's why that's named that way. Then you have your thoracic spine. So many of you who say, I have just a pain in my mid back. You might hear us call talk about it as the mid thoracic or the thoracic region. Sophia says it looks like the Day of the Dead. It <laughs> does. Dia de los Muertos. It does. Sophia. These are all the skeletons that people have sent me over the years, and I have other ones here in front. <laughs> okay, it's a little morbid. So we've got cervical spine, we've got thoracic spine, and we've got lumbar spine. Those of you who keep saying my low back, my low back. Nine, nine times out of 10, it's your lumbar spine right here. And you have about five of those vertebrae. And then we have, and this is the part people don't understand, your sacrum. This is also considered to be part of your spine. But instead of being individual vertebrae, these are fused together. And then last but not least, this little tippy point right here is called your coccyx. And people call that the tailbone. So when you fracture your tailbone or you sit too hard on your tailbone, it's your coccyx. And that's what you're referring to, all right? So it's kind of like that song, hip bones next to the tailbone. Okay. Yeah, I know. I just had to pull that one out. All right. So guys, next, and, and I do it this way because this is how things are just connected, right? So your lower spine is connected to your pelvis, okay? And here on Bob, you can't really appreciate it, but your pelvis is actually made up of three bones fused together. And this is probably one of the more common terminology you're going to hear. This part is called your ilium, and this is your iliac crest. So when your prosthetist and your physical therapist are digging into your waist to see if you're even on your prosthesis, this is what we're feeling for. 
And if you just kind of put your hand on your hip right here, that's that nice big meaty bone that you feel right there, your iliac crest, okay? Another part you're gonna hear your prosthetist and your physical therapist talking about is your ischium, right? And that's this part right here, okay? And the reason why I point this out is a lot of people will confuse this with this. Bob is very insulted right now, by the way. <laughs> um, this is, so I do want to differentiate. This is the coccyx, that tailbone I told you about. And this is your ischium. People call it your butt bones. I mean, basically when you sit down and you're sitting evenly on both of your, on, on your glutes, that's what's hitting there. And this is also something that goes into your socket for my above the knee amputees. So these are two landmarks that you're going to hear your prosthetist talking about with ischial containment. And I'm not going to get into that because that's, that's Greg's territory for next time. But just so you guys can start getting familiar with some of this vocabulary. Another one is called the pubic synthesis, and it's right in the middle. And it's a little bit of an uncomfortable area, but sometimes as physical therapists, we have to measure this. And the reason is, is because sometimes the parts of your pelvis can rotate and it can cause a lot of problems. It can cause pain. It can make it seem as if your leg is shorter. So if we're kind of confused, you might feel us digging a little bit here at the iliac crest to examine, but we also might have to just check the pubic synthesis, especially in our women who have had babies, because this can get um, uneven or it can become uh, displaced. Um, and that helps us find some of that stuff out. All right, so we're good so far, thumbs up. Good. What yeah. Are the uh, of <laughs> yeah, Beth's got a question, Cozy, uh, yeah. what's the name of the sitting bones? So I, you kind of covered it, but yeah. um, that's your... Sure. So Yep, sitting bones, Beth, butt bones, I've heard it called, um, your keister, basically that's your, your ischial tuberosities, okay? And you might, those of you who are above the knee amputees, your prosthetist might have to get their thumb and kind of just poke in that back area in your bum to feel where that ischial tuberosity is, just to see where it is within your socket itself, okay? Another common thing that you're gonna hear people talking about is the SI joint. It's the sacroiliac joint. And we call it that because it's the sacrum, this part right here, and the ilium, this part of your hip. And it's fused together and it's a little joint right there, okay? And it looks like it's fused together, but there's actually a, a joint right there. Ischial tuberosity, Beth. And I'm a terrible speller, but I'm gonna go ahead and try to see if I can remember how to spell this properly. Don't laugh. <clears throat> And Beth is my writer, so I know I have to behave myself with this. <laughs> uh, yeah. There we go. Ischial tuberosity. There it is. Yeah. Those yeah. are your sitting bones. The sacroiliac, the SI joint, the reason why I mentioned this is this is a big problem for pain. Usually in women, because again, when women go through pregnancy, all of these joints get a little bit loose and lax to accommodate for the weight of a baby and also for the labor process. So later on down the line, some of my women who have had babies start to feel the pain right there in the SI joint. And it's a pain that's like in the middle of your bum. That's what a lot of people will say. They're like, there's just a pain right there. <laughs> um, and it's not to say men don't get it as well, especially when you start using a prosthesis and things start to get uneven. This joint right here can take a lot of stress. Does that make sense, guys? Absolutely. Yeah. And I, I, that's what I, I'm sitting here like waiting to reach out that this uh, exactly will cause you a tremendous amount of pain if your prosthesis is too long or too short, because that's where your SI joint, it, it, it multiplies there. So good point, Cozy. Uh, that could create big problems. So knowing where that pain in your SI joint, because a lot of amputees, that's where it starts if you're not set up correctly. So. That's right. So moving on down, guys. And I always like to recap things because repetition is the mother of memory. So we've got cervical spine, thoracic, lumbar spine, sacrum, coccyx, also known as the tailbone right here, your iliac crest, that's where your, your, your clinician's gonna measure to see how high you are, right? And then the ischial tuberosities, the butt bones, right? Next moving along is this big juicy bone right here. That is our femur right there. That's our femur right there. So the thing to note about the femur Sorry, he is just not cooperating. The greater trochanter, that's that big knobby thing right there, okay? And that's another potential landmark that depending on, especially with our more slim folks, where we can palpate that greater trochanter and just see about alignment. This is also an area where some people might get a bursitis, right? 
So this part can become a bit uh, tender or painful, okay, if the socket's not fitting properly, all right? The other thing I want to notice is right here, this little groove right here, that's called your femoral neck, right? So here's your femur, that's the neck of the femur. When people break their hips or fracture their hips, that's where it happens. A lot of people think it happens in this area. That's actually called a pelvic fracture. Right. Here, especially for our elderly uh, women who have osteoporosis, when they fall and crack a hip, it's right here. Yeah? Any light bulbs going off, guys? Guys, you guys are awful quiet. In the no, room. it's awesome. I think you're spot on. And I think that with that, maybe it's the first giveaway time. Oh, yes. We need to do giveaway. Thank you, Jamie. Thank you, Jamie. So, guys, Greg, what's the first giveaway for tonight? Uh, first giveaway is, uh, and I got to read it because this is a uh, name of the first blog article that pops up when you use the link that Jamie just put in the chat box. Got it, guys? Okay, so yeah, this is going to be, uh, we're going to give you a second on this, uh, and we'll let Cozy keep giving us the anatomy lesson, uh, and then Jamie will let us know. But the, the first giveaway is a travel kit of the four-part system. I don't have a whole travel kit here because I keep tearing them up. Um, but yeah. Yes. I'm captive. Keep going, Cozy. Keep going. Susan, good question. Unfortunately, there's really not a list of PTs by state with specializing in amputee. Right. Um, we do have our professional organization. It's called the APTA, the American Physical Therapy Association. But unfortunately, we don't have an amputee section just yet. Um, so a lot of times, Susan, it's word of mouth. Usually I recommend to folks go to your Facebook groups and just start asking around um, and asking your prosthetist as well. That's right. uh, thank you, Beth. So guys, pop in your answers and then we're going to pick a winner from the people who submit answers. So type the name of the first blog that you see. All right, guys, we're moving down the chain. So we talked about the femur, right? Moving on down. You have a little round bone here that kind of moves around a little bit. That's called your patella, your kneecap. A lot of times people call it the kneecap. That's actually called your patella. It's a sesamoid bone. Basically, it means it moves around. It's not anchored to anything the way the rest of your bones are. All right, and then moving further down, we have the little skinny bone on the outside. That's called your fibula. And then we have the bigger meaty bone that's called the tibia. And that's your shin bone is what basically what people will call that, all right? And then in our feet, I always like to cover this because I do have some folks who are signed for uh, signs amputation and stuff. So we've got this bone right here. It's called your calcaneus. And another important one here is called your talus bone. All right. Poor Bob, you're just getting winged around all over the place. All right, guys, we're almost done with the anatomy lesson. And some of this will make sense when I go further into like the different terms you're going to hear about amputations. All right. So we covered the lower body. Now let's cover a little bit of the upper body. We've got the clavicle, which is the collarbone. So my husband calls them the champagne holders because they're just, they look like little champagne stems right there. And then you have your shoulder blade, which we call that the scapula, right? You've got your humerus. And it's, it's kind of interesting, the human body, it's, it's almost like a, like a double of itself. So the humerus is very similar to the femur in how it connects. It's a ball and socket joint, me being a nerd again. Thank you, D. Jackson, for participating. Thanks, guys. All right. And then we have our radius and ulna bones here in the forearm. And then we have like a million bones here in the hand, which I'm not going to name all of them because y'all will just go to sleep on me at that point. Okay. But that's the basics of your anatomy right there, guys. Any of this, anything that you guys have kind of heard and wondered, what did that mean? Or any questions about this so far, guys? Throw it out now. Let's see. Yeah. All right. Any questions? Put it in there. I'm, I'm reading the questions. If they're eight. Okay. So Beth Hudson, congratulations. You won yourself a travel yeah. kit. So Beth, yeah. after this is done, we're going to give you an email that you can email your address to so that you can receive your free kit, free travel kit. You have a sample over there? Awesome. Okay. So guys, those are the basics of the skeleton. And the reason why I do a lot about the skeleton is again, as a physical therapist, I look to see about my patient's alignment. And I really do look at them from head to toe. And I start at the head and I look to see how even everything is. And I look for certain landmarks on the body. And I know that Greg, when he's fitting his patients, he's certainly doing a lot of that as well um, when he's working with his patients. 
Right. Okay. Yeah. And, and I think what you're saying, Kezi, is really uh, something that everybody can uh, think about. If you feel like when you're, it's just, uh, if you're a transfemoral uh, amputee and you're walking along and you feel like you're, I always look at shoulders a lot. I guess that's where I'm going. So if you feel like you're kind of dipping on your amputation, uh, maybe your prosthesis is short. So I do a lot what you're saying, Cozy. I look at shoulders. I look at the height of the clavicle. Mm -hmm. I even do that more so than I do, uh, you know, uh, yeah, exactly. Um, then I, I, when I'm looking at the, uh, the, you know, your pelvis alignment, because you can really identify if somebody's dipping. Um, uh, so yeah, good point. Good point. I, going off, going off uh, your off kilter there that um... oh no 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 this is this is this is what I, this is the part I love and guys when we're looking at leg length it's not just it's exactly what Greg said it's not we're not just looking at the leg here everything is connected as you're seeing with Bob right so having a small scoliosis in your thoracic spine that was that mid part of your spine right if you have a little bit of a scoliosis there a curvature there okay that's going to make it look like one leg is shorter than the other. Right. right. So if you spend all your time looking at the legs here, you're not going to trace up the problem. OK, so that's where the physical therapist and the prosthetist can communicate to find out, OK, is it coming from the prosthetic fit or is it coming from the skeletal alignment there? Awesome. Yeah. Great. That's so awesome. All right. So let's talk about some of the more common muscles. And Ashley, I'll be answering your question at this point. Right. So a big one that you guys hear me talk about a lot on my show is the transverse abdominis. It's probably the deepest of your abdominal muscles and it runs like a corset transversely like this. And it acts exactly like that. It is the corset muscle of your body. And folks, those of you looking to lose a little bit of the belly pounds, that's the muscle you wanna target because that's what helps suck everything in and it provides support for your trunk. So that's a big one that I like to target with my patients. Okay. The other big one that you guys might hear about, and you might confuse it with a stabilizer is called the rectus abdominis, also known as the six pack, right? That's that nice, pretty one that we see on all those really good looking models, right? That's the six pack. And the news about that is it really doesn't do a whole lot with stabilizing your spine, guys. So a lot of people will target and do crunches and sit-ups and this and that and the other, and they're really not targeting the right muscle. So I always like to make a distinction with those two muscles, right? Next one, Ashley, your hip flexors. Here we go. Your iliopsoas. It's actually two muscles, but because they connect together, we put them into the same name, iliopsoas. And it starts right here on the ilium. That's the part of that, that pelvis I was telling you about. And then it goes all the way down here and it attaches here. Okay. And this is what does the hip flexion. Right. And hip flexion is when you're basically moving your knee up towards your chest. Okay, Ashley. So when your PT is talking about your hip flexors being tight, this is what she's talking about. Now, why does that happen, guys? Guys, the iliopsoas is a huge muscle, literally. It's like the size of my hand. Okay. And it's a big fan shaped muscle and it's a short muscle. Okay. So it doesn't take a whole lot for it to get tight. So if you're missing the weight of your leg, okay, and the higher up you go, the less weight you have bringing the leg down, the tighter that muscle's gonna wanna get. That's right. Okay, so that's why for even my below the knee amputees, you gotta watch your hip flexion to make sure you're not getting a hip flexion contracture, meaning it's getting too tight in the front part of that hip that can cause problems when you start walking. Yeah. How many times a day do you use that expression, hip flexion contracture, Greg? <laughs> a lot. Yeah, we hear it a lot. And if you're, if you have a hip contracture and it's not built into your prosthesis, then we can, that can create other problems. So your prosthesis should be really tuned in that and your PT with it. Uh, if you have that hip contracture that's present. So again, when I know what Cozy's going to say next, what do we work on to keep that nice and loose? So yes, this is a big one. Well, Beth is asking, is the hip flexor connected to the quad? If so, how? Yes and no, Beth. So actually your quads, right? And I'm getting to that one. That's a big set of four muscles, right? And they all start somewhere around here and it attaches below your knee. It's called a two joint muscle, the quads, because it crosses in front of your hip and it crosses in front of your knee. So your quads also help with hip flexion, 
Okay. Your iliopsoas is the big one for that one, but it's the quads and a couple of other smaller muscles that assist with hip flexion. Okay. And, and as a therapist, when I have someone who comes in with a hip flexion contracture, there's a certain way of doing tests to see which one of these muscles is really tight. Is it all of them? Which is usually the case. Usually there's tightness in all of them, or is it mainly the iliopsoas muscle? And that's usually a big one. And it's also a tough one to target because it's so deep in there. And I've got to get in there and it's you know, a little uncomfortable for the person to get in there to help release that muscle. Okay. Hang on, let me see. Yeah, the, uh, okay. there's a so, couple of good questions because, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So the interesting thing is your quad helps with hip flexion and knee extension. Right. So it's kind of interesting how it does flexion on one joint and extension on the other. The other muscle that's like that. Sorry, Bob, you don't have any hamstrings. Right. We all know about our hamstrings. Right. And they actually attach at that ischial tuberosity at that butt bone. Right. And they go across the hip. And across the back of your knee and attach to the outsides of these two bones. So it crosses the two joints as well. And that's kind of the beauty of the, of the human body. There's balance, right? So you have the big quads in the front that cross the hip and the knee. And then to balance them out, you have the big hamstrings in the back, right? Crossing the hip and knee. In the front, you've got that nice big iliopsoas muscle. And in the back, you've got big old glute muscles, right? So you've got that balance that, that one does flexion, one does extension, and they have to learn to work together, okay? And guys, this is where a lot of the problems will come into play when you're doing gait training, because if things are not balanced, right? If one muscle is not providing enough counter force to the other muscle group, then one muscle group is gonna take over and create problems such as pain, overuse injury. Yeah? Yeah, good stuff. All right, let's see. Actually, so I keep doing the exercises she gave me, but they are still weak. Is there something else I should do? Here's the thing, Ashley, when it comes to hip flexors, that's actually not the muscle I focus on when it comes to strengthening. It's the muscle I focus on when it comes to stretching, because that's what the problem it normally causes. Hip flexion and your actual gait pattern. I mean, yeah, you have to have some strength in your hip flexors. You can't just ignore them completely but they don't need to be big, beefy, rock solid to have a good solid gait pattern. Your glutes, right? Y'all have heard me say this a lot on my show. It's all about the butt, right? The glutes are the muscles that when it comes to muscle strength, that's what has to be super, super, super strong to power that gait. Make sense? That makes sense. Absolutely. Yeah. So let's see. After doing, I found your look at the powder. First day I didn't use it. Small says swim. I can't wear my leg. Oh, good. I'm glad to hear, Sean. Yeah. Glad to hear that's working out. That liquid to powder, I'm a runner myself, and I'm not an amputee, guys, but I love using the liquid to powder, and a lot of my patients with this heat in Florida works out beautifully. Right. Yeah, it's fantastic, and it kills bacteria and reduces odor and that, and that friction thing that can get us all. So um, yep. here's another good one, Cozy. Uh, can you explain flexion? Yes. So flexion, guys, anywhere in the body, it's basically where you're bringing two bones together. So this is called elbow flexion. I'm bringing my forearm towards my humerus, right? In hip, we refer to this as hip flexion. We refer to this as knee flexion, right? So you're going to hear the word flexion a lot in the human body. You know, we call this wrist flexion versus this wrist extension. We call this finger flexion, right? And the same thing with the spine. Moving the spine forward is called spinal flexion, right? So we're going to, you, you hear that terminology used a lot. And yeah, a lot of times people are like, flexion, I don't know. Bend your knee. Same thing as saying bend your knee, bend your elbow, right? Instead of extension, some people will say straighten, straighten your knee, straighten your elbow. That's also just called extension, right? So a lot of these terms are like, good questions, guys. Good questions. Yeah, good question. Here's another one. How do we strengthen our glutes? Oh, that's a whole nother show for later. Let me tell you what, right. Susan, there are it's just as many ways to skin a cat as you, how many times, how many different ways you can, you can strengthen glutes. Um, a lot of it to me depends on, you know, what is the strength we're starting off with? Okay. 
If, um, as a physical therapist, here's another word for you guys, manual muscle testing. This is the muscle testing um, parameters that we use to test the strength of each muscle group, right? And we can literally test every muscle group in the body and we do that individually. So if my patient has a very low score, like a one or a two strength out of five, then I'm going to put them in a very easy position to start the strengthening versus somebody who has a three or a four out of five strength I'm going to have them do something a little bit more challenging, working against gravity, using their body weight, right? So there's a lot of different ways to do uh, glute strengthening. Um, Susan, I'm going to put a little plug here now. Next week, I'm launching something that's going to help people with their strengthening. So just kind of keep that in the back of your mind. I was say different phases, right? I yep. love it. And I swear, that's good. Yes. Um, so extension is the opposite of that. Yes. Right. All right. So we're doing good? Yeah. Okay. So the next thing, and there's a couple more muscles that I'm just going to mention, guys, because again, these are very common things that you're going to hear. The IT band. How many of you guys have heard, especially those of you who are uh, in sports, the IT band, okay? It's this big, thick band that goes on the outside of your thigh and attaches on the outside part of your knee. And it has a teeny tiny little muscle called the tensor fascia lata muscle. And I remember that because our, our teacher would say, think of just the lattes. That's how he would have us remember that particular little muscle. The reason why I mentioned that is because a lot of people, especially my female population, will develop problems in the IT band when the glutes are weak, when the hamstrings are weak, and when the quads are weak. When those three muscles get weak or they're not working nicely together, this IT band takes a lot of the slack and people will start to get pain down the side of their leg, Great. okay? So something you might hear about. Yeah. All right, and then last but not least, as far as muscles that you guys need to be aware of and hear about is your gastroc soleus, or for my below the knee amputee, those are the big calf muscles. Um, and it's actually two separate muscles, but a lot of times we just combine it into one word and say gastroc soleus <laughs> complex, but it's actually two, two sets of muscles right there. All right, guys, we good? Love it. Like Love it. Talking. All right. So let's talk about amputations. How many of you know the official name of your amputation level? That's yes. A good no? Does anybody know? No? Yeah. Okay. That so says, yeah, Beth, I know you know. You better know Beth. You know this stuff. So, all right. So let's talk a little bit about the different amputation levels, guys. We always start, I always like to start at the bottom, right? So when people have their toes removed, we simply call that a toe disarticulation. The articulation, the joint was removed. And that's basically it. Then we have transmetatarsal. And I don't know if you can see, Bob actually has a pretty good, so this row of bones right here, these are your metatarsals. So when you have a transmetatarsal amputation, they basically go through the middle of those bones, okay? So that's kind of how amputations are done, guys. It's either done on the joint itself where they just separate the joint or they cut across the bone itself. Does that make sense? Yep. So when it's, when it's taking apart the joint, they'll call it a disarticulation. When they're going across the bone, they'll call it trans whatever bone they're going across. So in this case, it's a trans metatarsal, okay? And then moving up, we have what's called the show part and they really don't use, I don't, do you see as many show part amputations? Not much, not much anymore. That's yeah. I didn't either. That was, that was definitely a terminology that was used more back in the dinosaurs when I was in school. Um, but basically it means between the forefoot and the hind foot. So basically they're just detaching some of these bones here. And usually, and some of you may have experienced this, you know, they try to preserve as much as possible. So they might start off, start off with just removing some of the toes. And then if the circulation doesn't work out, then they have to go transmetatarsal and then move their way up. What I've kind of noticed nowadays is most surgeons can see that when they start removing toes, they know that eventually they're going to have to move their way up. So to save their patient several surgeries, they might just go ahead and do a below the knee amputation if they see that that's where things are headed, okay? Another one that you see is called the Symes amputation. And basically Symes means is that they remove the foot. The ankle bones, the malleoli are still there. Now, what's interesting about the Symes amputation, S-Y-M-M-E-S, is that a person is still able to put weight into the end of their amputation. They still have a little bit of the heel pad and it's put underneath there. Okay, so it allows for that. 
but it also causes some problems with fitting for a socket. And I'm going to let Greg take that over next, next time, next time we see each other. Yeah, absolutely. All right. So we get so far guys. And then moving up, we see the trans tibial and that's exactly what it means. It means it went across trans tibia. Some people will call it a below the knee amputation. So depending on how old you are, we'll determine which terminology that you're using. <laughs> that's right. That's right. Right. Moving up the line, guys, when we take apart the joint, we call that the knee disarticulation. Okay. And again, like the signs, the person who has a knee disarticulation can put weight on the bottom of their leg. They can bear weight into the socket right through there. All right. And then moving up, we have transfemoral, meaning you're cutting across the femur, transfemoral. After that, we have a hip disarticulation. So basically this entire part is removed. And then after that, it goes up even higher, the hemipelvectomies, which I think I've only ever seen uh, one or two in my career. I don't know about you, Greg. I... Of several, not, not, not a ton either. Not a ton, yeah. And no. then um, a corpectomy. So a corpectomy, guys, is what basically when they remove the entire lower half of the body. Um, and obviously that's done in very drastic circumstances when it's usually cancer related, um, where the tumor has spread and that's their only way of saving the patient's life. Okay. Yeah. Okay. All right, guys. So I need to do a little bit on the uppers because I, I was, I was here from people. You didn't do anything, show any of the uppers some love, but first we're going to do another giveaway. Okay, good. Good. Second giveaway. All right. So uh, good point, Cozy. I always focus on lower because that's what I live every day. So, um, well, I'm anxious to hear about that. So uh, second giveaway, everybody ready? Put it in the chat box. Name of the first recorded webinar that pops up when you use the link uh, that goes to our webinars. So Sounds good. Do, 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 do. Get the Jeopardy. All right, guys, free travel size kit here, free travel size kit. Great, right, back to the, and in those travel kits, you get day moisturizer, night moisturizer, the cleanser, and the liquid powder. So we had a great comment put up today, tonight, uh, about how the liquid powder really changed somebody's life. So um, it's a fantastic product. <clears throat> All right, guys. So we're going to go ahead and do just a little show, show our uh, upper extremity amputee a little bit of love here today. All right. So it's very similar to how the lower extremity progresses with the amputations, guys. Um, first, you're going to start with finger amputation or phalangeal disarticulation. And again, disarticulation, just a big old fancy word for removing the bone at the joint itself. OK, then you have the partial hand transcarpal. So it's just basically across these bones. Oops, actually up here across these bones, the wrist bones. So all of the carpals that are right in here, when that's removed, they call it a transcarpal, okay? We have wrist disarticulation. So that basically means that the entire hand is removed, but this part of the wrist is still there, okay? We have a below elbow or transradial because it's cutting across the radius bone, the radial bone. Then we have elbow disarticulation which is just that the entire forearm is removed, but this part of the, the whole part of the humerus is still intact, okay? We have an above the elbow or transhumeral rotation, so it can be anywhere across here apart this bone. We have a shoulder disarticulation, which would bob. I can actually do that. So that's a shoulder disarticulation right there, okay? And then we have what's called a four quarter, where they remove the clavicle, I was able, oh, we'll remove this clavicle, the clavicle and the shoulder blade. Okay, and again, usually those are very, very extreme cases where there's cancer involved um, or extensive damage from, from trauma. All right. Mm. Ah, yes, you can, Beth. So the travel kit is at two ounces. So it means, I think, airplane is three ounces, Greg? Yeah, yeah, two yeah. ounces, okay, you're good to go. Three ounces the minimum. So the, the travel kit is just that. You can bring it on your, on your carry-on. Okay, so there we go. So Greg, what are some of the things that you've heard a physical therapist say that you think are typical physical therapist? I'm That's, a great, <laughs> That's a great question. I think uh, a lot of the uh, physical therapists I've worked with are really focused on um, strength training, um, you know, and, and you're very unique, you know, Cozy, and I think that's what's so you, uh, great to have in this, your webinar series, because a lot of PTs I've worked with, they really are not lower limb or, or limb loss specific. So they kind of use the same protocol for 
that's for the GP or general population. So, um, and I think that's okay. That I think there's there's parameters we need to uh, stay within when we're working with amputees. And you know that I don't have to preach that to you. Um, but uh, that, I guess that's my biggest uh, thing that sets me with some PTs out there. They're just like, okay. Uh, okay, let's just do this same exercise without any modification. And some of us don't need that. Some may need a modification. And I think when you're starting to get um, uh, no uh, thought and theory process, just go, hey, let's go on the squat rack with a transfer my MTT, then I'm like, whoa, whoa, time out, you know. Um, so um, I guess that's where I go with it. And the first thing that really impacts me is, um, you know, we all want to be like we were previous amputation or disability. And I'm okay in one aspect to say, okay, great. I'm gonna be like my peers and let that PT push me like that. But I think it's very important to have your PT understand um, what your situation is, identifying hip flexor, you know, hip flexion contractures or um, what that you know, momentary um, limitation can be. Um, so I guess that's where I go when I think with PTs is like, in the past. Now, again, cozy, everybody is, is a unicorn. So uh, I'm sorry to say it, but um, it's very unique to work with you because you identify the issues that not only uh, that every amputee encounters, if that's height or alignment or socket uh, 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 strangulation or hydrostatic pressure is too great or too big, or you, start, you can identify when there's 17 ply, what we should do. So I guess where I go with it is having your PT understand all the things that you're enduring um, is so important and your outcome is going to be so, um, so much more gratifying and quicker and that, that rehabilitation um, cycle is, is a lot, lot uh, shorter than it can be. So that's kind of my PT process, why I appreciate what you do, uh, Cozy. Um, it's it's so important to have the PT be able to identify um, what may be wrong or right with your prosthetic setup. And I think that, that I always used to go around this country and fix or reprogram or try to make things correct. And uh, I would always joke about like, is this a Monday build or a Friday build? Because this prosthesis is two inches short or two inches long. And, and, and it's really important with, with uh, what Cozy's talking about with your skeletal structure. If, you're asked, if your prosthesis is at three quarters of an inch too long, that puts such a pressure on your SI joint, which can create catastrophic issues and take you out of that prosthesis, create back issues. So um, again, I'm gonna go back to listen, make sure your PT understands that. And if talk to your PT, and that's where this whole show is about tonight, this webinar is making sure that you understand some of this anatomy, what you're experiencing, how the socket should feel and fit, and that your PTs are uh, along those same uh, thought processes. So. Um, so that's that's where I think, uh, you know, when I start preaching here, that's what's the most important thing. So, um, yeah, I know that's a long answer, but <laughs> I, I love what Beth's saying here. I had to fire a PT because they didn't have any official training with the So, uh, yeah, and, so. and there's something to add to that. And then Susan says, I've been to at least six T's and none of them really understands the amputee issues. And I keep searching and guys. This is probably what I get the most questions on um, in terms of the emails and the messages I get throughout the week from my viewers is their, their difficulty in finding a physical therapist. And there's several things to do there. The, usually the first thing I tell the person is look outside your zip code. Um, to me, it's, 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 it's absolutely worth it. I have my own physical therapist, guys. I actually have two physical therapists that I go to depending on what my needs are. Um, and, and to me, it's, it's a quality of life issue for, to allow me to keep running, to allow me to stay active as a physical therapist, to have a good physical therapist. And it took me years to find these two particular ladies that could really help me. It took me that long to find PTs that could address my needs. Um, and in some cases I've had to go outside of my zip code and travel a bit. The next thing I tell people is talk to your prosthetist and introduce them to your physical therapist. Absolutely. Guys, I had the benefit of having one of the best PTs in amputee world train me, but I learned so much from the prosthetist that was down the hallway in the hospital that I worked at. I learned so much from him because I was calling him in every five minutes going, I don't know what I'm looking at here. I don't know what this thing is. <laughs> I don't know 
works. And he was the one who would teach me how the nuts and bolts of the prosthetic device was working. Okay. I had all the PT knowledge up here, everything that I learned in anatomy, you know, that was all there. And every physical therapist has that bread and butter knowledge, guys. Every physical therapist has trained for gait training. That's the foundation of our profession. Okay. So a lot of times, if you just introduce your physical therapist to your prosthetist, there's so much communication that can happen there where they can start putting together plans of care. And in today's world, this is one of the things I, I like about social media is that you can connect someone. I, there have been several times where I've taken phone calls from around the United States from PTs that viewers have sent me to say, where do I start and, and, and start that communication. Um, so if you're, if you're willing to kind of think outside the box a little bit um, and find the physical therapist who wants to help you, okay? There was a time where I knew nothing about it. I could barely tell you the difference between a below the knee and an above the knee. <laughs> You guys, I had to start somewhere, but I had a desire to learn. And many physical therapists that you're going to run into are going to have that same desire to want to learn, to want to help you. So that's the PT you're looking for. If you can't find the one who already has MPT experience, find the one who's willing to learn and who's willing to introduce themselves to your prosthetist. That's my soap. Yeah. I, I agree. Yeah. And uh, that's important. And, and there's a good relationship and communication between your PT and prosthetist. I think that everybody's probably aware on here and I see some comments. Uh, it's super important to find a prosthetist that actually listens and sees and works with your needs to see that your outcome is optimized. So, and that's not, you know, that's your PT, that's your prosthetist too. Um, one thing I will say, I think if you're, uh, I like the, the, the terminology going out of your zip code, for prosthetic care or PT care, but if you're a new amputee and you're going, you live in Miami, Florida, and you're going to uh, Northern California for prosthetic care, that's not a real convenient thing to do, especially if you're new. Um, once you become seasoned, then I say go wherever it takes, but um, there's gonna be some drastic changes in socket and uh, designs in your first year. So just trying to stay in your, in your, uh, in your zip code kind of theory, it's pretty helpful in your first year. Then, then if you venture out, then make sure your, your, your process is listening to you, evaluating you, putting you before any of his schedule. I think that's so important that um, don't put yourself out where you got to get on a plane to get an adjustment because that's not real convenient. And again, you're the one who lives with the prosthesis. So um, just, just be aware of that. Um, and I like what Susan's saying here, I travel 150 miles for a good process, okay? That's that's doable. That if you've got to fly across the country, that 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 can impact your performance, especially if you have socket issues and you can't walk on the prosthesis because it's you've shrunk down or gained weight, whatever that scenario is. Trying to take that plane to get there is something to really think about. So, um, I just that's my soapbox to keep keep it close to your season up, and uh, you probably won't go anywhere else because if somebody's got your care going like that. Um, but yeah, it's really uh, interesting to find that person who listens, who understands anatomy, who understands socket design, how that socket's supposed to fit, regardless if that's you know BE or you know or, or transtibial, whatever that may be. That's that's in a very important link. So. Um, so that, that's kind of my thing initially. I've got patients and uh, Kayla, the gal you talked to as well. Um, she's trying to figure out where to go. And I think locally where she's at, and I'll just put it out there, maybe the process can get her going, but inevitably she wants to excel and be a, a marathoner again. You may have to go elsewhere, and but that's fine. But in your first year, oh, I don't know. It's, it makes it pretty tough. So hopefully you got a good process in your area. I think today there's so many great processes uh, it's not like it was 20 years ago where there was some good, some bad. Um, I think everybody's pretty darn good today. So I'll just say that. Um, Absolutely. I think we got some good questions going, coming up here. I'm, I'm missing them. Go ahead. Uh, you want to so, read one? Let's see. Beth says it's also important that your PT reads your medical records and understands any comorbidities you, that interfere. You. And this is, again, this is a part of our training. For every single physical therapist, we take differential diagnosis courses, we take pharmacology courses, we take uh, radiology courses on how to read radiology reports and how to read, you know, x-rays and MRIs and all stuff. So these are things that we are trained to do. And this is exactly why your amputee patient, and I'll say this to my students, your amputee patient is not just an amputee patient. They are a high blood pressure. They are a diabetic patient. 
That's in right. one case, in one case, I had a bilateral traumatic amputee from a car accident, bilateral above the knee. She was 16 years old. So technically she was a pediatric patient. She had right. vertebral fractures, spine fractures. So she was a spinal cord injury patient. She had a horrific burn graft. So I had to treat her as a burn patient. She also had a mild TBI, traumatic brain injury. So she was a neurological patient. So you have to pull from all of those different specialties in physical therapy to treat for amputations, guys. And as we grow older, right, we're living with more comorbidities. We're living with more diseases and illnesses that will impact your life as an amputee. And yeah, your physical therapist should be doing a very careful history and physical, taking a medical intake. My husband teases me. He looks at my intake forms and he's like, that looks like the ones at your doctor's office. And I go, yeah. It should, because <laughs> all that's going to affect how my patient reacts with me during treatment, right? All right, we got here, people live in rural areas, have the hardest time, and in my experience, and you also mentioned about the CPV program, the Certified Peer Visitor Program by the Amputee Coalition. That's a very valuable program because these certified peer visitors, they can sometimes be the connector uh, between all the different clinicians and all the different resources um, that a new amputee needs. Yeah. Yeah, that's fact. And I think, uh, Beth, your comment, uh, it's a hard time in, in very rural areas. I kind of live in a rural area and uh, you've got to go quite a quite a distance from even where I'm at to find a process that's local or whatever you want to call local. But again, it's in that 100, 150 mile radius. And some of the bigger clinics in Colorado, I live in Western Colorado, but um, I pa have patients that have no luck around in this area and they're traveling six hours to see a prosthetist. And that's a, that's a big, that's a big week if you're going down there for a new socket or adjustment. So just be aware, but you know, again, this is your life, your body, find the person in the PT or the prosthetist in the PT who is going to allow you to do what you want to do. Don't put, don't feel like you're limited, you know, you've got limitations because the process is not capable of your goals in a rural area, then it's time to go out of that zip code. Absolutely. That's just, I always used to giggle about like, oh, well, my process told me I'm never going to wear uh, tight jeans again and run. And I'm like, okay, well, let's, let's fix this. You know? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, uh, so I think that's a great point, Beth, that you're putting out there, but, um, just do your research. And I think there's something very exciting like Cozy mentioned coming up that's gonna help uh, PTs nationally and, and patients here. And I, I'm not gonna say any more, but I, I just think it's fabulous and uh, yeah. Next Wednesday, guys, next Wednesday. <laughs> okay, that, that's my big plug for the evening. So guys, I think we got one more giveaway and Senor Paul is going to put up a link um, for you all to fill out a survey. Oh, he's so good. He did that real quick. All right. So guys, fill out this survey. We're going to pick someone randomly from there to win another travel size kit. Guys, this survey really helps give us feedback as to the different topics you guys want to hear about. Tonight's topic actually came from the survey uh, where several of you had posted, you know, talking about all the different jargon that clinicians will use. So we do look at these surveys and we do appreciate uh, thoughtful feedback to help us improve this show and because it's basically it's for you guys great yeah yeah please do it everybody you know vital fit's been so great to sponsor these webinars and i hopefully everybody's learning that we need to spread the word and spread the love here and uh uh share share the survey share this with your friends and you know, we can get more attendees on here and, and inevitably we're here to see outcomes be optimized and uh yeah just please send it out there because vital fit they're all about education and, and seeing the patient is comfortable um, and the education is top notch. So uh, yeah, share the love guys. All right, guys. So guys, post in any last minute questions that you have about what the world is my PT saying. Um, you can go ahead and throw that into the chat box. In the meantime, I think Paul's got a couple of more interesting fun slides for us this evening. Right, Paul? Right. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. All right. So, guys, we do have a code for you this evening. As you can see, it's right there in nice big bold letters BFSC20 to get 20% off your next order. Um, that's a really great coupon, guys. And these yeah, products are already reasonably okay. priced. So, yeah, get yours. Get yours. There you go. 
That's right. And, and these these uh, travel kits last year, I don't know, 30, 40 days. So that's a deal. Yeah. Uh, uh, so yeah, get on it. Yeah, it's a good deal. All right. And in our next slide. Oh, wait, I know her. Really, All right. Yeah. So here, here's my shameless plug time, guys. If you haven't had a chance, stop by my show every Wednesday night, rain or shine, 8.30 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. It's on my Cozy Talks Facebook page. And you can also watch me on my YouTube channel. I stream from there at the same time. So uh, we're going to be talking a lot about balance tomorrow. So come see me. Yeah. Yeah. Tune in on that, everybody. Yes. Huge. And then, guys, if you have any questions, you can uh, direct your questions to the lovely Christine Erbacher. And if you see her email is down there on the bottom. Um, guys, I, I've been working with the Vital Fit team now for uh, two years now, um, and they really do appreciate the feedback. Um, they take it to heart. They, they uh, listen to what people have to say about the products so that they can continue to improve the experience for you all. So there's your email. That's who you want to talk to. Great. Reach out to, reach out to Chris, everyone, or reach yep. out to me. Uh, I'm on all the social media sites too. And I know you can reach out to Cozy and we're here to help and here to uh, see that your outcome is optimized and uh, Vital Fit is there. Like um, just uh, we're here to make it make your day better. So thank you, Cozy. I think it's All so right. awesome. I learned a lot from you tonight. So I'm oh, like, you. got to really prep for uh, part two of this webinar. So uh, yeah. You got to bring your A game, man. Next time. Yeah, man. I don't know. I'm, I'm already at the B game here behind that. Presentation, <laughs> though, but I hope everybody learned something because I sure did. And I think it's really interesting that uh, Cozy knows more than most you know, orthopedic surgeons out there, what's going on uh, with bodies and, and muscle groups and socket fit for sure. So cool stuff. Nice, yeah. very entertaining. So and, and guys, join us in for the next webinar. Put it on your panel. It's going to be part two. So the mm -hmm. stuff you hear coming out of your prosthetist mouth from this guy right here. Part two. Yeah, we're going to talk about sockets. We're going to talk about how they should fit, all the different cool stuff that's out there. And so I, hopefully you can think in a, in a couple of weeks here with some good questions and, and try to stump me because I got Cozy to back me up. So I'm good to go. <laughs> You're in trouble, man. Hey, guys, special thank you to those of you watching us on Facebook and our big winner, Sean, tonight from our Facebook uh, audience. So thanks again, guys. We will see you. Keep your eyes peeled for the next webinar coming out, part two on vocabulary your clinician will be using. And guys, if we missed anything, feel free to email us. We are so easy to find, right. <laughs> easy to talk to. In the meantime, guys, thank you for letting us be a part of your lives this evening, and we will see you next time. Thank you, guys. Thanks, Cozy. All right, everybody. Have a great night. Happy Halloween. <laughs>